I think that's a really good way to start. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, first of all, this is, uh, this is base camp beta number 38. Is that right, Chris? Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> let's <laughs> say yes. <laughs> Officially, thir- I, th- th- my gut is that it's 38. Um, but you It's know. like label catalog numbers, you know? They don't... <laughs> Right. <laughs> Got the they don't band really mean back anything. together. Um, so this is a this is a, a little panel we put together for uh, Nick Klein's "Bring Flowers to the Theater," not "Flowers to the Gallery." I kept calling bring, it "Flowers." Bring bring the, the flowers to the theater. <laughs> bring the flowers. The, that's Come on. <laughs> at Sarah's. Period. Um, which has been a month long fantastic event that Nick has curated. Uh, bringing together all sorts of cool artists and performers, um, people you've never heard of, people you know uh, because they're mega famous and cool. People um, you wish you never heard of, all of it, yeah. the whole spectrum. <laughs> um, so it's been, it's been really uh, a special event and uh, you know, an honor to be uh, uh, a part of it. Um, so our contribution here, um, Nick graciously asked us to uh, to join in for the uh, for the endeavor, and uh, our contribution is a panel on the end of music, uh, the topic on everyone's brain. Um, so we decided to uh, put a prompt out there. I wrote a little mini essay, which I'll read shortly, um, to a bunch of artists and uh, colleagues, um, uh, just to see like what people thought about you know uh, about our current moment and how music can continue to exist. Um, uh, and this structure kind of mirrors the overall structure of Nick's event. Um, you know, this, this kind of a uh, way of bringing a bunch of different perspectives together on a very broad, but you know, kind of um, uh, contemporarily evocative uh, question. Um, we also have with us, uh, Steven Taylor, if you want to say hi. <laughs> uh, Steven Taylor is a musician, poet, ethnomusicologist, uh, uh, and many, many things. Um, it's great to have him here. Um, he'll be reading uh, uh, his response to, uh, to the, the end of music and, uh, I guess, uh, contributing his thoughts on, uh, on other things if... Uh, if he if he feels uh, fit, uh, so yeah, I think that's and of course we have uh, Chris Miller here in the in the cyberspace. Hello, hi. Uh, good to see you as always, Chris. Even if you're very very yes. far away, it feels it feels like you know you never went away, kind of. <laughs> and we're always zooming people in anyway, so. Yeah. This uh, talk is brought to you by Zoom, by the way. Uh, yeah. Thank you to our corporate sponsors over at Zoom. Um, really appreciate it. All right, here we go. I, f- I finally found the, uh, the text in my email. You know. uh, so here we go. The, the, on the end of music. <clears throat> in the early days of 2023, as the world struggled with the arrival of the post-pandemic new normal, a dormant discourse was reinvigorated. The arrival of ChatGPT, a powerful AI chatbot capable of sophisticated human-like conversation, raised again the specter of automation. From the Occupy moment to the farcical campaigns of Andrew Yang, automation has drifted in and out of popular consciousness, and depending on the, uh, the alignment of the stars, it will either bring us salvation or ruin, plunge us even deeper into precarity, or free us from eternal drudgery. While previous popular discourse on automation focused largely on potential fallouts in manufacturing and service sectors, <clears throat> ChatGPT, along with other recent AI tools like image generators, DALI2, and Midjourney, posed threats to sectors previously deemed untouchable. Privileged creatives were suddenly in the crosshairs. What did the future hold for artists if their work could be automated? Was this the beginning of the end? Of course, the eschatological fever has recently subsided. ChatGPT turned out to be closer to the mechanical Turk than the singularity, and AI image generation has yet to put every graphic designer out of business. 
Yet there is an unshakable uncertainty as we wade further into our new normal. The bullet was dodged this time, but how much longer until the next disruptive technological breakthrough, or the next financial crisis, or the next pandemic? And all these fears are set against the backdrop of terminal decline, of the middle class, of the global political order, of the earth itself. The new normal is taking form not as an open horizon, but as a series of closing doors. There's a future, yes, maybe, but all it holds is the end. This end, that end, and the other end too. Which brings us to the topic at hand, the end of music. But perhaps let us start with the beginning. In 2019, Chris Miller, Chris Zaldua, and myself, Sean O'Sullivan, three music world veterans with waning enthusiasm, enthusiasm for nightlife, did something profoundly ill-advised. We started a podcast. Basecamp Beta was born as a podcast for people who love music but hate the music industry. <clears throat> Katie O'Sullivan joined us shortly, and we utilized this platform to host discussion with like-minded artists, mostly San Francisco and New York-based musicians adjacent to techno, noise, or avant-garde forms. Throughout dozens of conversations, a recurring motif emerged. Nobody could see much of a future for the world of music. Among media types, the prevailing doctrine of the moment was that the music industry would be fixed by some kind of technocratic hack. Stiffer regulation, a new platform, and or blockchain technology would save the day. <clears throat> and musicians would again be able to continue earning a living wage. Yet, through our folk anthropolo uh, yet our folk anthropolo anthropological methodology revealed that the artists themselves had little to no faith in these approaches. Even before the pandemic, it was clear that music itself was an intractable crisis. Rising touring, costs, rising touring costs, declining media sales, gentrification and austerity measures were pressuring artists, labels, venues, and promoters to their breaking points. In early 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic hit with full force. Many of us hoped this would be the end, an end for the music industry that would clear a path towards a more sensible, sustainable, community-centered approach. In an early pandemic episode of Base Camp Beta, we waxed poetic about Depeche Mode's construction time again, a touching album about, about loss and rebuilding as we imagined new musical futures. But of course, the end didn't happen, and thus no beginnings. Instead, new levels of austerity were imposed and, in, and internalized, and the greatest bur burdens of isolation and disease were borne by those already least privileged. Yet the music industry hobbled along, and our artists hobbled even harder. It was neither an end nor a beginning, just an interminable trough. Interminable trough. But why are we still in this trough if the pandemic is over? Perhaps when we lost sight of the end, the beginning also slipped out of view? The political economy of post-pandemic music is complex. In the early 2000s, the cruel hegemony of the CD came to a mercifully abrupt end. <clears throat> MP3s were heralded as the future, a leaner, more egalitarian form. Maybe they were the future for a bit, but nobody was buying them. Streaming via YouTube and Spotify further pushed music into immaterial realms. At this juncture, music has no real commodity form. As such, it has no value unless affixed to another commodity, maybe a film, a show, an advertisement, a video game, maybe a live experience subsidized by the alcohol industry. Music's economic devaluation is coupled with a broader cultural devaluation. Why own music when you can lease it? <clears throat> the streaming model grants subscribers incalculable volumes of music for a nominal fee while impoverishing the artist. What is music worth when ownership and access are detethered, when music has become essentially free? Music's quasi-decommodification is a curious phenomenon. Platforms like Bandcamp and Nina have become staples for sustaining small <clears throat> and mid-sized art for sustaining independent music spheres, providing much needed revenue streams for small and mid-sized artists. Well, these are valiant efforts, uh, particularly Bandcamp's beloved Bandcamp Fridays events where 100% of the proceeds go directly to the artist label. The grounds on which they are often championed are perhaps the least exciting ones. When viewed as attempts to put music back in its commodity box, Bandcamp becomes simply a vector for a scrappy DIY capitalist ethos. But the platform also contains a more radical element of mutual aid, <clears throat> gift giving, and community building. Does music's decommodification present us with useful political opportunities? Are there, are there ways that we can lean into this crisis in order to foster greater solidarity? 
or are these platforms merely palliative care for a dying medium? Beyond the political economy of music, there are broader, perhaps more evo evocative questions lingering. The AI, the AI generation of art raises questions about the role of music in human society. What is humanity without music? Is the creation of art by human hand a necessary condition for human social formations? Will people simply cease to make music if sufficiently powerful AIs were devised? Imagining a world of humans without music prompts us to consider the inverse, a world of music with no humans. In our age of exterminism, it's increasingly easy to imagine a world without humanity. <clears throat> Given the pro proliferation of truly existential threats, it's hard to imagine a world where humanity continues to thrive. What does music sound like in a world with no humans? What is the sound of the end and what comes after? So that was, that was the prompt that we sent out to a bunch of artists. Um, and uh, so yeah, uh, we got some interesting responses back and we'll go through them. But, uh, but first, let's, uh, let's just talk for a moment. Let, and let me breathe. I'm terrible at breathing. Yeah, you just read a lot. That was good. <sighs> that was good. Take a sip of seltzer. Yeah, let's get you some water, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> I do have a water here. Yeah. A vitamin water. Don't want to get, get too it. scratchy. I, you got a vitamin water. <clears throat> I cough a lot. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of blasted through that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so what, uh, <laughs> what, what does everyone think? Any, any initial, uh, initial? I think it's interesting how much, I mean, obviously this has been kind of a uh, theme of ours for years now, is the kind of collective freak out as music seems to as the music industry seems to be grasping onto some kind of commodity form to keep music the way the way that we recognize it to right. to keep selling music as a as a commodity um, it's interesting to me how much the introduction of all these AI and automation things that seem to be increasingly something people are talking about um, it's kind of like a I don't know if I, it's, it seems like it's a bit like diagonal to, to the question of like music as a commodity. They're both, it's just like another new thing for people to be freaking out about. And I wonder, this makes me think about um, how we picture collapse and the end um, and the end of music, the end of, you know, whatever, the end, at the end, at the end of everything. Um, and I increasingly think that I, I can only imagine this. It, it feels like we must be in some kind of horrible endpoint where there's this constant growing freak out as we, uh, you know, like approach a collapse point and we'll never act that will never actually, uh, you know, hit like the, we'll never hit a end point. The freak outs will get more and more, uh, freak out, I don't know, more and more. What? The freak outs will get more freak out. Freakier. They'll get more freak out. And there, no one will, there will be no climax, no release right. for this, mm. for this, uh, I don't know, seemingly collective craving for this is, this is your, um, like, some anti-eschatology, anti basically. I don't know. That's a big word. I don't know what it means. Uh, I always get that confused with scatology. <laughs> and it always weirds me out when I'm in, when I hear it in public, because I'm not sure what kind of vibe the room is engendering. <laughs> <laughs> no. I was going to say that eschatology is an offshoot of bebop. Uh, uh, oh, please elaborate. I was joking. It's a joke. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, scat singing. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ella Fitzgerald. Awesome. Uh, I was, I was kind of thinking about what you said, Chris, um, the sort of lingering... Well, the, the need to sort of cling to some kind of commodity in the face of a thing that just like the system doesn't work. But I think that it's important to kind of look at the dualism of it because uh, while it's an unsustainable practice and however it operates and there's all these issues with sort of the, how, how commodity defines itself in the first place, there is this weird uh, 
other side of the coin, the residuality where in the face of so much atomization, like the the media that is exchanged via the commodity, that's a that's a method of bringing so that literal exchange of item to person is a modality by which people can sort of uh, recuperate from this general ambient anxiety by by the simple act of, hey, Sean, here's this thing that I made in an addition, and this is for you. And I and you know, it's it. I think like the additions necessarily uh, have to operate on a more intimate exchange, but it's kind of hard to decouple, right? It's hard to decouple what that baggage of those items is with, you know, sort of any greater sort of political disinterest in, you know, what it, what it, what it is a sort of metaphor for, or it's analogous to or something. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think increasingly, like, uh, you know, as the sort of ambient anxiety of everything and everyone kind of like keeps building, um, the sort of intimacy of a of a shared musical experience or sharing something, you know, a, a, a piece of art that you've made with someone else, um, you know, that that sharing that moment of sort of bonding or whatever um, feels more and more important and feels more and more. It's something you want to grasp onto uh, more and more as, you know, things kind of seem to be collapsing, but it's interesting to me how we value that, you know, commodity. What there's always the question of, you know, how, you know, getting artists paid, whatever, um, you know, how much do people value uh, a piece of music? Um, and of course that just kind of, to me at least begs the question, you know, what it, to me, it just, it doesn't bring the, it doesn't bring the, it doesn't uh, summon for me the question of how much do we value this, but you know, what it immediately asks the question, like what is value at all? Like as, as things are, especially as the horizons look, uh, you know, not so great. Um, you know, what is this value that we're talking about? Are we talking in terms of money or, you know, talking into what, you know, what is it, what is this value that we're placing on these objects? Um, if it's the value between you and me sharing a piece of music, that's great, but that doesn't seem like something you can put a dollar amount on, but it seems that all the, all the questions asked and all the solutions offered, um, are always, you know, in some kind of dollar amount or something like that. Of course, makes sense. We're all broke. Like <laughs> everything is, uh, we, we, you know, yeah, we, we, everything's we getting more capitalism. expensive. That's, that's not that's not going to change anytime soon, unfortunately. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but you know, there's, there's just uh, I don't know. It's always I think it goes back to the initial strangeness of music as like a commodity, um, art as a commodity. You know, um, the sort of intangible feeling and emotion and uh importance and the the way it ties to memory and all of these things um don't seem to it, it seems strange to try and capture them in some kind of uh monetary value and some kind of commodity that we that we place a value on but um yet that's kind of all we we that's kind of how we have to keep on thinking about it um Right. You know. well, well, but I guess part of part of my 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 general prompt here was like, well, maybe 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 we don't have to think about it that way anymore. Maybe maybe yeah. maybe we maybe maybe we we will be forced to no longer think of it that way. Um, yeah. That you know, music. You know, like on Bandcamp, people pay for what pay pay for the music basically what they want. Um, kind of with the assumption that like this is all music you could get for free anyway if you really wanted to. The music's right. out there for the most part. You can, you can find it on YouTube. You can just listen to it literally for free on Bandcamp most of the time. Um, you could pirate it through whatever means if you, you know, if you really want that, uh, that lost, <laughs> lossless file. Um, so music is already kind of free if you want it to be free. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I wonder to what degree we will continue, can continue to see that shift. That you mm -hmm. know, 
and again, if, if, if there are ways that this could be, could be exploited or leaned into to kind of like, you know, um, it help people think about music not as, yeah, not as a commodity, but as a, but as a gift. I think um, with, with like automation, the music that immediately begins to accrue more and more value is AI generated music that you would use to pay like a, you know, let's say uh, you run a H&M and you pay some kind of library a fee to stream right. music and you know that music is you know I think the music in those kind of locations is largely uh, if it's not already mostly AI generated it's sure it's sure going that way <laughs> um, so it seems that like the more and more AI generated music goes out there it's kind of like this music for what was it Martin Scorsese said something about like there's like commercial movies and like personal movies or something, um, you know, movies made for a commercial return and movies made for just per puro amore, you know? Sure. Um, it's, it's I don't know hard, how much It's pretty hard to make has, a movie just for yourself. I mean, I guess it's... Yeah, I know. Yeah, of course. Well, on, on one hand, it's easier than ever. Every, anyone can do it with their phone, but yeah, you know, certainly making but a with, Scorsese movie, uh, <laughs> I yeah. think, takes a lot of money. So. But with music, it seems that, yeah, I think like you know, immediately the most valuable music becomes the music that is, you know, made to be played at, you know, a retail store or you uh, mean, you mean valuable old like music. In, in terms of performing an economic kind of function. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, that's what we'll get. That's what, you know, people right. will actually pay for. Um, I mean, the music you make to want to share with friends. I mean, you're, or, you're, you know, you're right that like already I know on Spotify there basically are, you know, a huge number of playlists out there that are essentially music for retail spaces that are just, you know, yeah, if, if not actually AI generated, just like turned out at high volume, you know, kind of, yeah. a new, kind of a new kind of library music, but without any kind of pretense for artistic value of any sort. Which is maybe, which I think is maybe a good thing. I mean, I've never been interested in making music for, you know, a Uniqlo yeah. dressing room. I think it's a really important to dis I think it's an important distinction to sort of talk about like the like what are we orbiting this valuation around? And so like we're talking about things that exist in a very broad mass cultural, you know, thing or scenario, but I think the the economy of like what we all certainly participate in is something that's a little bit more scaled down it's like a micro version of a bigger thing especially through like the landscape of club music and things like that which is you know necessarily functions on a kind of negotiation of mass and uh specific specified curated content you know you know we were talking earlier about the differences in you know micro genres and stuff like that and you know to most people they're really not a thing but um no, I don't know. I, I think it's, I don't know. I, I guess when we talk about this, I feel like, uh, like an ostrich putting my head into the dirt because I, I really always, I, it's going to of course have this like broader fun, like cultural, uh, implication, you know, these things like Spotify or Bandcamp and all of this stuff. But, uh, I'm curious more about like the phenomena of our micro worlds, you know, that we operate in and how that impacts us. Because I think we necessarily have to say, you know, fuck these systems really, because they just, they don't, those, these, these ideas don't even really apply to us. We have to operate on the phenomena of our mutual immediate exchange, right? Like, I don't know. For sure, but then how do we, you know, then it's always a question of, you know, what Sean always says, you know, it's like, how much does it become us yeah. all circulating a $5 bill amongst ourselves, exactly, yeah. you know, yeah. Totally, um, yeah. an internal economy yeah. that doesn't, <laughs> that has to, uh, you know, right, right. pay ban rent or whatever. Camp and, and but, Bezos get a, yeah, a penny each time you, you know, you pass that $5 bill around and that's soon enough. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Of course. Yeah. All of the, uh, everyone takes their cut along the way. Um, I think, I, it makes me think about why we make music. And I think there's a very old-fashioned notion that 
comes to us really through the romantic movement in the arts, but prior to that it has a kind of ritual origins that music somehow generates life. That there's some, you know, when I started in music school 50 years ago, I was told by my composer teacher that music was going to save the world, you know. They believe that. Um, I think uh, I think also of like the notion of the organic intellectual, that you do your work where you are, right? So if there is, if there is some utopian effect or some bonding or some revolutionary aspect to the art that you make, I think most artists sort of subscribe to that kind of a notion that they can push things a bit, you know? William Carlos Williams, the poet, used the expression uh, with regard to poetry to push the century forward an inch. You know, you spend your life and your career pushing the century forward an inch. Of course, the notion that something's going forward is also a culturally specific assumption. But I think we come from a kind of salvationist uh, or, or ritual-based view in so many ways. And so, um, you know, I, I was going to say, you know, there, there, we don't know of any culture on the planet that doesn't have music, right? Right, yeah, that's, that's how you start right. the, uh, so, the, 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 the response. Something's going on, and they're not, yeah. see, you know, and, you know, this, of course, goes to salvage anthropology and the, you know, the primitivism and the idealization of the so-called savages and all that. But um, there are also, there are societies and have been societies, and until the 1700s, when the music, when the pop music business was invented, um, mostly music was shared between people uh, in, in small settings, um, with a f folk basis, uh, oral transmission folk basis. And uh, periodically, since the 1700s, it seems to me that the pop music industry is predatory upon indigenous or traditional cultural forms, which it then sort of spins out, spends out, and then it moves on to something else. And I know this is, you know, I critique in my piece, I sort of critique the notion of a grand narrative as a kind of eight, 19th century hangover. But it's very, and this gets mocked in the literature also, but there's the idea, if, even if you just look at rock and roll, or, you know, it keeps going back to the well. And then you get something fresh. And then, you know, then you get progressive rock, and then that kind of gets a little tired and you know maybe diluted and then and then it, you you go back and you get Iggy Pop you know so i think there is a kind of cyclic return to roots and the sense of the music having some kind of a mission just say one more thing before i forget there's a wonderful sociologist who's gone now but his sort of retirement book you know when you retire you can write about whatever you want he wrote a book called the seventh the seventh stream which is about the origins of rock and roll and he says it's there's seven streams there's like gospel, folk, um, what, uh, uh, jazz, blues, uh, uh, something else. Um, he names like six streams. Three of them ha carry a sense of authenticity. So if you're a jazz musician, for example, you're never going to be strictly commercial because that sense of the authenticity mm -hmm. goes back through blues and gospel. Jazz, blues, and gospel, and folk always carry a sense of a kind of authenticity or something other than a commodity. And so that, there's a sense of something needs to be kept pure, right? So th there's that, and then, and then you have the offshoots which are like, you know, pop music basically, black pop, white pop, and, and uh, do not carry that sense of authenticity. Um, that's, but often they they well, they, they either well, they draw, invoke they it or, come or, out or, of it or, they, yeah, or, 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 or sure. predatory of it. Yes. You know, you mm -hmm. can look at so much pop music, and as a, as I heard somebody say off stage one day, there's a lot of church in that, you know, because that's somebody who knew that that music was coming from gospel. You know, the audience might not know it, the artists might know it, but but all of the musics keep going back to that that sort of root, I think, and we've seen it in my in our in my own lifetime. I've seen it, the folk music revival of the 50s and 60s was built out of recordings that were made in the teens between the First World War and the Depression, when musicians were still learning their music from their aunts and uncles, you know, and not learning it from records in the radio. So the last big bang in that kind of uh, uh, recovery of the root goes back to the 50s, and that goes back to the World War I. So um, 
I think there is a cyclic nature to it, and I just wanted to bring up that idea of the authenticity, however problematic a notion that is, um, some kind of spirituality, some kind of root, and a, and a sense of humor that you find in a strong, um, multifaceted culture that has not been commodified. Something like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I agree. I mean, the, the notion of authenticity is a, a, a really, it, it is a thorny one. Um, and it, it, it's interesting because, I mean, most of us, you know, uh, on the podcast right now and, uh, you know, a good chunk of our listeners operate broadly in, you know, in techno-derived forms, which mark a very stark break from, from you know, the kind of rock tradition. And certainly there's, there's no, no clear direct lineage back to folk music whatsoever through techno, uh, even if techno is a kind of contemporary folk But form. maybe not American folk, right? But, like, it's clearly compositionally rooted in, like, you know, cultures from other Absol places. Other Absolutely, yes. Right. yes. Like, it, there, there, there isn't a clear line to... To yeah, like Appalachian folk music. Yeah. Uh, well, we all come from Mother Africa now, Sean. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is that, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> um, you know, of course, of course, they're, they're, they're techno uh, techno evokes uh, uh, folk musics of, of of many many other sorts. Repetition um, creates depth. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Tin Pan Alley didn't give you that. You know. Absolutely. <laughs> you. Um, Sorry, not. I, I. I also. I really like this idea of talking about authenticity because I. It makes me think about, um, in relation to how we discuss, you know, the economies or how that might imply the end of kind of anything. Uh, I feel like this is an elective uh, activity that we participate in, and with that electivity, there is a uh, set of parameters by which we operate in. One which is the constant reality that there is no guarantee to having anything other than a payoff than the ritual, the spiritual. You know, that burden or that blessing, depending on how you look at it, is kind of deeply rooted in here. And I think for, and again, just for myself, it always abstracts how I approach conversations like these or ideas like these as they apply to like mass cultural phenomena because no one ever told me that I would get anything out of this other than my immediate catharsis within it so other than not dying that's certainly not music music saved all of our lives i think <laughs> I, a lot of friends a lot of friends a lot of friends i would argue have been lost through doing this too absolutely you know? anyway i just I, I like the idea of authenticity because it roots you having to sort of negotiate this elective burden or blessing um and sort of what comes with it so sorry yeah, I mean, authenticity is really, really an interesting one because I mean, so much of the last twenty years of music and of, of you know, subcult like whatever subculture, has been oriented around, uh, you know, um, a, a really extreme rejection of authenticity, um, of all sorts. Um, so it, it's interesting to see the way that 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 our, our notions of authenticity do continue. We we do continue to to, as Stephen said, dive back into the well, but in different ways. And as uh, like authentic, uh, authenticity shifts, um, as we're seeing now with like this whole new generation. For for me, like I'm now in my 40s, so I'm officially a, an old old dude, and uh, I have now seen a, a new wave of music, music, like young musicians come out, who I have no direct connection to, who they do things that I, I frankly don't understand and often don't like, and I have to like really bracket a lot of that and just kind of bite my lip and be like, okay, this is exactly what I was doing 20 years ago. And the people 20 years older than me were like, well, I guess. Um, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nick, is, Nick is making a, the, uh, the, the grand wheel gesture. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, I guess what I'm saying here is uh, authenticity is, 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 is both, um, both a constant it's, it's, it's both constant and changing. Um, yeah. But of course, even in like pop music, I feel like it's interesting that you say that the past 20 years has been, music has not been interested in authenticity because I feel like on the other hand, I don't know, just surprised 
to hear you say that because I feel like in many ways it can be very the music in the past 20 years has been super hyper focused on authenticity I feel like a lot of I don't know it just seems to me that a lot of uh pop music or even in in whatever techno world we have inhabited um this sort of well, te- techno, I do think drive. Is, like techno, like like jazz, uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it's its closest kind of musical, uh, you know, uh, cousin. Um, but we, you can use pop as like a way to describe an entire um, access point of music, you know, like whether it's any genre. Like that, I, I I hear what you're saying, Chris. I mean, even the the way labels operate, you know, if you wanted to get. Uh, Nirvana, you had to uh, sign Royal Trucks. You know, you had to have like this this idea that your business machination was interested in integrity and authenticity, at least on a surface optical capacity. That's how you further engender, you know, more business. That you, you needed to legitimate yourself. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, and I I, I I I don't think that's something that that you know uh, most facets of the music industry have engaged with in the last twenty years. That that. That that need for legitimacy um, via authenticity. Perhaps, um, yeah. I just feel like it, I feel like there are some. I you think, know, I feel like I, any I think, any 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 like uh, culture subculture of music has within it, um, you know, more folk, uh, authentic uh, strains, and then uh, uh, pop oh, yeah. strains. I mean, we see this, of course, in like you know, whatever it is we've all been involved in, whether it's, you know, noise or techno or whatever, there's, you know, um, there are certain, there's a certain part of that world that is a purely, or it seems at least a purely commercial venture. Um, but it seems to me that that world is always pantomiming uh, authenticity, is always trying to present itself as authentic as possible. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it, it does seem to me that uh, at least in the very commercial, yeah, whether we want to call it pop strains of different genres of music or just commercial strains of, of music, um, you know, it does seem to me that authenticity seems, I don't know, that, that people do seem to be pretty uh, interested in at least seeming authentic. Um, well, let's, let's bracket the authenticity talk because we could go yeah. on this one for, I think, some time. Um, and let's, let's play one of the pieces of music. Um, I was thinking it might be interesting to start with uh, Scott Young's contribution, uh, his, his uh, Satin Doll Project, which is a, um, a machine learning assisted endeavor. So this will be a a way to discuss how AI might perhaps be not um, not a, not an ending point for music, but 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 a way to generate new forms. Um, so let's let's launch that. <clears throat> Thank mm-hmm. you. 
So that was uh, Cry Trumpet by Satin Doll. Oh. Uh, Chris, you're not here. You kind of missed out on the, uh, the outside collaborator, uh, which added quite a, quite a dimension to the work at, towards the end. Um, oh, yeah. Someone not doing so hot on the street, it sounds. But it sounded great in here. <laughs> yeah. So that's... Uh, was that sort of easel, that sound pool, you know, rooted in, like, uh, I have a friend, Alex Lusos, who does this machine learning to create, like, kind of text, like, between languages and stuff like this. I mean, is that sort of how that, that palette is brought up? I mean, um, do we know anything about the insight to that? I, I, I believe that song was um, uh, the sound of... Scott's newborn child processed through the timbres right. of a trumpet. Oh, cool. Um, via DDSP audio morphing. That wasn't a real trumpet. Yeah, it sounds like looking into DDSP, it sounds like it's uh, sort of signal processing that's trained on, you know, neural networks or something like that. So it maybe like trained to. Yeah. Yeah. It sounded like a saxophone. It's really hard for samplers to do real horns. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it reads, it, reads, it's, it, yeah, combination of acoustic or acoustic in instrument modeling and, and then also a, a real human acoustic source. Yeah, um, very cool. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know, I like, I, I liked that piece a lot as a kind of, um, a, a kind of like, you know, just a rebuttal to the idea that AI music, that, that, that AI uh, doesn't present new creative opportunities. Um, yeah, I feel like as always the the conversation around it is either like oh either AI makes whack music 
or um you know it's like the you know uh the it's end like, of everything you know yeah yeah exactly um whereas like like any tool uh it's how you use it and in the hands of good capable musicians who are interested in you know exploring music it can make very interesting sounds and yeah you know something compelling and in the hands of I don't know, people who make wax stuff, it sucks, you know? <laughs> right, <laughs> it's, right. It's, it feels like it's always been the case, you know? Yeah, you, um, you can you can make great music with a no, no input mixer. Uh, you can make garbage music with a full orchestra, whatever, you know? Totally. <clears throat> um, the, tools are, the tools are the tools. Um, yeah. But the tools can also be, like, genuinely interesting. And, uh, you know, new tools, it even sometimes takes a while to to you know for people to get their hand around what the most interesting thing to do with a new tool is yeah you know um plenty of like early electronics you know um i don't know that they you know the first uh attempts at using electronics were necessarily the most compelling you know it takes a lot of people and communities and time to mess around with things until they you know discover what could be uh you know what new and uh you know really engaging things can emerge from those new tools so yeah absolutely yeah i mean yeah 50s and 60s electronic music is not as good as 50s, 70s and 80s electronic music so <laughs> in broad strokes i mean yeah um any any other thoughts on uh on satin doll uh, I liked it. That's all. <laughs> uh, no, I like you said. Like I, it just makes me think about when you you have these kinds of like revisionist anthologies and of the canon of how experimental music has always kind of operated and who is set in stone as the progenitor of what. I mean, at this threshold, which I'm not in any way an expert on, but you know, when you hear sort of things like this, it's not. You know, you, you you sort of see like the the structural uh, sort of formative basis by which vocabularies evolve, and um, you know, I find that very very interesting. And you know, it's nice composition there. It's cool. Nice to hear voices in there. That's yeah, it's it's, it's really, really makes it. Yeah, it's really great. It's really uncanny. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so what what should we do next? Do you, do you want to read your piece, Stephen? Should we do another music piece and then 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 do you? I don't know. You tell me. We should do Stephen. Okay. I would love to hear. This is a brilliant man here. So. Well. <laughs> so I'm going to present this as a poem as a poem uh, because okay, I mean sure I'm going to present this as a poem because uh, then I can sort of be silly. Uh, I'm just thinking of um, a reading once where uh, the great great poet Lawrence Ferlinghetti was reading and he said something. He said he didn't like footnote poetry. He didn't like poetry where you had to explain anything before you read the poem. So I'm just going to do this. Um, all right. So uh, I wrote it very quickly on the way home from work. Um, anyway. So on the end of music, uh, 21 March 2023, the essay that serves as a prompt here is concerned with the future of music when rising costs, falling earnings, and the ev evolution of artificial intelligence meet the corporate mass media with a promise of eliminating humans from the making of music. So that, that's what I took the prompt to be. Okay. It's been a while since I've been current on the ethnomusicological literature, but it's probably still safe to say that there is not a culture anywhere on the planet that doesn't have music. However, most don't have a word for music. They have terms for things like wedding songs, dance tunes, and what we might call tropes, scales, and rhythms, but not a word for music in the abstract. That's mostly a Western thing. And of course, the West has penetrated everything, so this is kind of... Anyway, when I hear the end, I also hear the beginning. Omega has, Omega has a bookend, alpha, and these bits of furniture hold up the Bible which is also a Western thing, like a motorcycle. To assume that music is a general phenomenon will have an end implies that it had a beginning, 
to move eastward, I would refer you to the Vedas or your favorite Zen master. What if there always was and always will be music? To try to establish the origin of any human thing seems to me a fool's errand, not that plenty of serious people haven't tried. There are wonderful books by the great musicologist Kurt Sachs, for example, uh, The History of Musical Instruments, 1940, The Wellsprings of Music in 1962, in which the good professor asserts that, quote, the beginnings of music were purely vocal, and that in early periods, the reasons for using instruments were totally different from those of singing. I mean, how could anyone possibly know that? He says, all higher creatures express, express emotion by motion, but man alone apparently is able to regulate and coordinate his emotional mo movement. Man alone is gifted with conscious rhythm. When he has reached this consciousness and experienced the stimulation of comfort that rhythm gives, he cannot refrain from rhythmic movement, from dancing, stomping the ground, clapping his hands, slapping his abdomen, his chest, his legs, and his buttocks. Serious scholars no longer tend to engage in such specu speculations. The grand narrative approach to social science having been dissed in the Pomo scene era as a 19th century hang-up, though there's something, some interesting debate about whether a 60,000-year-old bone drilled with holes was a Neanderthal flute or a hyena chew toy. All such speculation about the beginning seems pointless. As for the end, there isn't one. In the early 70s, after Jimmy died and the fabs broke up, I thought that music has ended, had ended, or rock had, so I tuned in jazz and the classics until somebody took me to a strip club in nowhere Zen, New Jersey, to see the Ramones. And there, perhaps, lies the answer to corporate takeover, artificial intelligence, and the end of music. As long as there are misfits whose only skill is blasting three power chords, there will be music. I live on in the faith that artificial intelligence will never appro approximate the towering idiot genius of, hey, daddy-o, I don't want to go down the basement, there's something down there. Particularly given its invocation of Shakespeare in the rhyme, I don't want to go, hey, Romeo. No robot will ever approach so closely the sublime. My day job these days is as an English professor and lately, there's been much concern in the field about AI writing papers for lazy students. But such papers are lifeless, utterly lacking in imagination, and any poet, we're all poets, of course, can spot one a mile off. They tend to read like bad ad copy. Poe's enigmatic mastery of mystery and the macabre is a dead giveaway. Back to music. The robotics necessary to play the guitar, for example, are eons away. So maybe the solution for music makers who make music using computers is to stop using computers. Put down a synth, pick up a fiddle. The history of popular music since pop became a business, circa 1700, describes a cycle of predation on folk styles that degrades the matter the more it commodifies it, only to give way periodically to a return to roots. Most of the mass market product sucks, and then it dies. The music, will, the music that will end is that which was moribund at birth. At the moment, we seem to be at the end of another cycle where small ensembles of vibrating strings, air columns, and skins have given away to overproduced electronic junk upon whose demise living vibration will return. In the mid-70s at a session in Woodstock, I recorded a song with a very successful top 10 singer who assured me that nobody does guitars anymore. That's dead. It's all keyboards now. Thus, the death of the guitar was announced to me a week before I saw the Ramones and five minutes before my guitar tracks absolutely made that guy's song. There's another bit. Yes, here we are. It's all keyboards now. Remains a problem. Personally, I have always had an ambivalent relationship to keyboards that links in memory to Ezra Pound, that old fascist, but he had some good ideas, in 1918, comparing the piano to the handsome cab a vehicle which he notes it resembles and whose fate Pound hoped it would follow. So let's get back to things that robots can't do, like singing <laughs> and playing non-virtual instruments. <laughs> Better yet, I might suggest that bone flutes stomping and slapping our buttocks is the way forward. Gabba gabba hey. That's my, my <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, you... you, you you, you make a very uh, poetically forceful uh, argument. Um, and, yeah. Uh. I have a question for you. Do you think, 
I, I, I follow your train of thought. Uh, I, I, first of all, I, I love the writing. Um, do you think that keyboards and guitars have the same level of accessibility? And sort of I what the say implications yeah. I are? I would say yes. Yeah. At the level of do it yourself, yeah. I think so. Cool. They both get really difficult really quickly. It's it's like yoga, you know, you can it's okay at the beginning, but after a while it gets difficult. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I I think about uh sort of the structures that are in place over time and the way like a music industry adapts and what it gives to people to express themselves. And so for me at a time, it was easier to download free software and then make compositions with that yeah. and then play shows than it was to say, get a guitar that had the right wood with the, yeah. and anyway, I think that's kind of like a circ circumstantial production line thing, but I, I was just curious your thoughts. Yeah, on. yeah, you work with the tools that you have. Yeah, and I mean, you know, that's a commitment. I mean, even just, well, you know, string instruments are very complicated. I tend to, I tend to favor instruments where the body is in some way in contact with the actual sound wave. So a, a horn, a voice, a skin, uh, a vibrating string. And once we get past that, I get a little lost. And I'm a lousy keyboard player anyway. You know, so. <laughs> um, I guess, I, I, like, I, the, oh, you, you, Chris? Oh, I was just going to say that I, I, I really appreciate um, the sort of call for a return to a kind of folk music not it's interesting to me the, the term folk music has always struck me as a bit weird because it seems like it describes all music before it's like a catch-all for any music around the world that existed before like i don't know a, a phonograph or something i mean i i, I mean certainly folk music was recorded in you know yeah to be preserved but um, thinking about like a return to folk music, um, a return to, uh, the way music maybe had always been, um, when you say to put the computer down, uh, you know, that made me just think about before when we were talking about this kind of scene, uh, of all of us interested in music, but all of our music is currently living in this computer world where money slowly is extracted from it. And so putting the computer down, you know, um, maybe we can still make, muter, make music with computers, but rather the center of the scene, the center of vibrant activity, um, the more and more that takes place on the computer. And it seems even as we are always, uh, as we're talking about this, it seems that our world keeps moving further and further into the computer and into these spaces that are owned by, I mean, this podcast is going to go out on Apple um, podcasts, you know, or whatever. Um, as we move further into those realms, the, the sort of folk tradition, the, the music as it always has been, um, seems to be further and further out of sight and more and more necessary. Yeah, and of course that is tied to uh, live situations. Yeah, and it's the it's the computer. I I don't want to disc computers. I'm going to say it's the electronic um, commodification or assumption of music that puts the live gig out of business ultimately. Yeah, it's I, just I, not cheap. You know, nobody can afford to do it anymore. I remember years ago, uh, a friend of mine who's actually my managed my band, and he had a long he had worked with a lot of artists. He had a long pedigree. He said the reason you can't have any small venues in New York City is insurance. The reason there's, right. no, there's no live venues in New York City until you get to a fairly large size is because nobody can afford the insurance. And that really struck me. You know, the, really, the, the economics of it, th that kind of economics of it. You know, Ed Sanders, my great brother in music, uh, who co-founded The Fugs, is, which is my present band, he said the 60s happened because of rent control, <laughs> right? You know, $40, you get, you know, World War II rent control is still in effect on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. For $40, you can get a pad, flip hamburgers two days a week, and you're, you're an artist. Mm. You got a, you know, you got a gig, you got a the, living. The, the 60s were also, like, 
you know, st still on the tail end of the New Deal, though. Like, yeah, yeah, there, and the socialists. There's other, yeah, yeah. yeah there's other, other kind of uh, socioeconomic factors yeah. there. But yeah, now you totally. need a job. Ed also joked that now you need a job. One job for your rent, one job for your food, and another <laughs> job for your art supplies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had we had a talk of, uh, a few weeks ago with a group that existed, uh, like an art, a nomadic sort of pedagogic art project. And it was like a, it was this sort of nomadic school and it operated under the sort of um, precarity of the real estate market in Miami. And through that, you were able to have all of this kind of rev revelatory, kind of ecclesiastical, great, beautiful art, you know, utopian exchanges. But that was like a byproduct of kind of the ruins of, uh, of a city in financial shambles that kind of mirrors the idea of like how I at least look at New York in the 50s, 60s, in you know into the 70s, obviously. Um, that's yeah, I mean when I was touring with the with a hardcore band in the 80s and 90s, all the gigs were in squats. You know, and those squats were operating partly because they were feeding people. They would squat a building in a neighborhood and they would feed the people that needed to be fed. They would organize. They would give young people a place to stay. And, you know, so then the real estate, it's really hard for the real estate interest to come in and take on an entire neighborhood, right? This, this makes me think, you know, in Sean's intro, he mentions gentrification. And it, that's something that I, I th I've thought about more than AI in this is more so the inevitability of a kind of fractured system in its first place. I don't think it's these broader, bigger models that are the issue. It's the fact that the current models we operate within necessarily are a little parasitic. And so it's not, um, I don't find, like all of the places we play in require a level of negotiation at a sweet spot in a very violent gentrification cycle. And so it's... Um, Especially in Europe, that's that's been something we witnessed very well, firsthand. Well, I, I mean, for me, it's New York. I've oh, yeah. watched the consistent sort of eastern bound sort of re-territorialization. New York I live in, so I don't see it. It's yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's funny, you know, the, the DIY models in Europe are different because there's only X amount of space and people have to negotiate in a different way. But when I think of like the end of music, I think about the way music, even in its best of intentions, even the most sort of progressive, idealized, uh, utopian, forward-thinking people have still relied on the dregs of a much larger problematic issue. So it's kind of like not confounding or surprising to me when on the other side of it, on a bigger scale, there's just as much sort of parasitism, I guess. Sorry. That's something I thought about earlier. And, yeah, it's this, the search for like a space to even express these things in is just nearing a sort of impossibility. It's like, uh, you know, um, I don't know, it's like we're in Mexico in like 1910s with all the hacendados creeping and slowly erasing any public space and just mm -hmm. the foreclosing of all possible mm -hmm. spaces to mm -hmm. do anything. Mm -hmm. um, total which, total enclosure of the commons. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, my generation, <laughs> yeah, exactly. and my generation and the generations before, I mean, it's a, it's a cliche where you say, oh, you should have been here in 1918, man, you know, <laughs> in downtown, you know. <laughs> but it's true. I, it's just worse. Every generation goes, how are the kids going to do it? And they keep making it. They right. keep making art. That's, that's amazing to me. It's amazing to me that there's independent music scene in New York City. I can't believe it. I don't know There's how you dozens do it. of them and yes. and some of the music is good. <laughs> yeah, how do you do it, man? Man, I thought it was bad in the 70s and 80s. Wow. <laughs> um I what what I uh, to to change uh, rails a little bit. Uh what I was struck by in your piece Stephen was uh one like the the, the centering of a, a an audience in physical space kind of community oriented practice which we've kind of touched upon with the discussion just now, but also a, a performance ethos that is rooted in the physical. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, and you know, like, certainly computers could factor in there in some way, but still there needs to be a, a human intervention, mm -hmm. a human generation of sound. Um, and dance, dance, like bo <laughs> bodies in there, you know? Yeah. A time-based, an ephemeral time-based medium that is actually being generated by bodies. That's 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 the kind of a thing. 
the, the live musician, whatever the instrument is. Yeah, the, 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 the audience generates the music as much as the musician. Yeah, 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 yeah. boy, I know that one. Um, yeah, so something I, yeah, I think we, we, we all love and it's harder and harder to find, so. Um. Well, and it's even, I feel like it's even, it always, it keeps getting further and further in the sort of uh, world of dance music that we all seem to be in, which is like, uh, yeah, there seems to be a no, well, I mean, in certain spaces, sure, but it seems that the trajectory has been to remove the audience participation yeah. in the act of music yeah. making itself. Um, yeah. And it, yeah. yeah. It just reminds me of something you said. Uh, in a lot of the literature on popular music, it'll say, you know, if you're looking at the traje trajectory of a style, you say, when people stop, when the kids stop dancing, look out. Right? When Benny Goodman got so fancy that it was no longer dance music, within, you know, within five years, every big band in the United States would out of business, right? Because it was a dance music, you know? So I, I'm, I have a great deal of faith in the presence of the body in these things. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, so next, uh, should we, we go on to the next uh, topic? Sure. Yeah. Let's see. Actually, I think a, a, a good follow-up to that will be a, a contribution from Nick Hallett, uh, musician. Um, uh, his project, Plantains, he sent over, uh, said this is a... This is, this is his response 20 years ago, almost to the day, uh, to what was then the, um, uh, the, the discourse around file sharing. Um, so this is from 2003, it's Plantains, I listen to the Plantains.
flashbacks to 2003? The last time we had a real music community in the uh, Soul Seek chat rooms. It, totally. Uh, yeah, yeah well, it, uh, I guess I guess on one hand it uh, it brings to mind just how, how how long we've been having these discussions of like how, how how can music exist in a digital digital space within you know a truly infinite reproduction available um, or nearly truly infinite reproduction. Um, So that was a work that was uh, in response to a file sharing dilemma. Is that what you said? Uh, it's, it's the, 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 it was. It was about the, the, the crisis of music prompted by file sharing. Mm. Interesting. Uh, and it's a song about plantains. <laughs> well. Yeah. <laughs> um. I I I think of 2003, and I I would have uh, I would have loved to hear that. I would have loved. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I there, and it, this is like not in any way like a a front to the content, but I I feel like um, you have. I, I I am curious of the the relationship of content to the er the erosion of the infrastructure, you know? Uh, elaborate. How do you value something? Is it in its depth? Is it in its, what it, you know, is it expect authenticity or something, right? Like we're putting a valuation on something that's exchanged and what, where is the resonance that creates that value, right? And so I wonder sort of, like, I think it's, um, you know, in literature, you'll have a lot of big words that will uh, sort of uh, parlay you into thinking that this is of value. And so I kind of, I just worry about, sort of, I don't worry about, it. I'm curious about what your thoughts are on if the product is not sustaining an entire culture, how does the content match up to sustaining a culture as well? You know what I'm saying? Like, what if something's not good? What if there is no value to something that can, like, further usher in or bolster an economy around something? Right. Well, I think the dilemma with file sharing at the time, right, was that the value was just basically in scarcity. Um, you know, it was like, there's only, you know, if there's an inf infinitely replicable, fi you know, it wasn't that a good record cost more than a bad one. It was just that the record cost what it cost because there's only X amount of them. And, you know, um, and so, you know, this whole file sharing dilemma 20 years ago was all about, you know, uh, well, now that we don't have that, forced scarcity how do we value music and of course that's the exact same conversation we're having now where you try to create and the conversation of the past 20 years is how do you create that so do you create an nft do you use some blockchain thing to enforce scarcity on some thing to magically create value that but of course that just goes back to the old way that we valued music that really was only active for like 60 years or something. Um, I, I guess where I was trying to go with that was the idea that through the broader devaluation, I think there's like a lot of freedom. And so if there's, an, like I'm not familiar with this person's work, uh, I love that song. I think it's great. It reminds me of a lot of things that I liked at the time and I still have a fondness for. Um, I find that in the devaluation, there's a lot of artistic freedom because the again, there's no, it's that in, um, it's that elective burden idea again of within the parameters. Now you can do whatever you want. You can have extreme headiness. You can have. When you're not caring at all about making. Yes. Money. You sure. can have, you can elect to have frivolity. You could elect to have all these kinds of things. And then in your over, you have 
amassed like a wide depth of field. And so like while there is a financial concern on the flip side, it's like, well, now you can do whatever the fuck you want. You always could, but you don't have to negotiate so much. I find that kind of nice. I mean, I, I certainly have enjoyed making music more in the last couple of years that I am not caring about trying to play gigs. So I can say that much. Yeah, that's interesting. Since the pandemic, I mean, I've really enjoyed, deeply enjoyed writing, knowing that uh, the songs are going to be recorded. Although my aesthetic is for a live thing, that was a relief also because of the pandemic, right? I don't have to schlep equipment, you know, I don't have to have, my chops don't have to be in top condition. <laughs> right, don't have to practice. Yeah, I can, I can just write the songs and get them in a studio and put them down. That, that, that has been a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. So that goes completely against the uh, the bodies in the room. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we got four old guys, you know, we got five old guys in the room and we didn't kill each other. That was pretty good, you know. Well, you can you always know. get virtual bodies in the room on a Fortnite <laughs> rave experience. That's what Zoom's for. I can't, wait to I can't wait to get a booking agent just for the metaverse, you know, then I yeah. can... <laughs> I think I could really, you know... Get a blow up there. Yeah, yeah. I think that's where I'll really finally take and be able to scale this thing up. You got more media? Yeah. Where? Over there? Uh, no. But it's... it's uh, well, we'll talk about that. For sure. Oh. Chris, how's, how's Barcelona today? Oh, it's nice. Yeah? Yeah. How you get away okay. with that? <laughs> <laughs> Moving? <laughs> it's a lot cheaper here than it is in New York, so uh -huh. I yeah, invite yeah. everyone else to consider it. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, here we go. So let's, let's uh, listen to a contribution from, uh, from our good friend Nick Dawson. This, this one is called, I'm Sorry It Had to End This Way. That was on repeat. Uh, <laughs> that's a, a Are we ready to go? Uh, My firmware's updated? I'm ready to... <laughs> exactly. Sound very familiar to uh, at least uh, some. Uh. <laughs> I love Nick Dawson. I love... Uh, we've always... Sean, you and I have always talked about how um, he's like a real working class musician, and we've seen him play... A, such a, a mass amount of gigs and there's you know you'll see him do a certain kind of thing one way a certain kind of thing another way he's really masterful but he's also extremely brave in his practice and yeah it do, it does not give a shit he wants he, he does what he's gonna do that yeah great yeah, yeah yeah um that 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 piece by the way though for the, the those of those listening and steven you probably did not recognize that sound that was the sound of a, a firmware update for uh, 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 what was a Volca drum? There's the Korg Volca drum, I believe. Um, so he's, Nick is playing the prankster here. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it, uh, 
it certainly prompts some questions. I, don't I mean, th- I, don't I think it's a prank. A prank is maybe overstating it. Yeah. I, think, um, I mean, it, ju- it does make me think of, I mean, I think, uh, well, if for, for those who don't know, my, my day job is, is, is I work for a synthesizer company. So I kind of live in, in this world of uh, instruments. And um, it does make me think about the, and this feels like a kind of trite point, um, and I kind of can't believe I'm saying it, but um, the sort of uh, gentrification that happens within the world of instruments and musical tools. Um, I'll say it another way. It seems to me that like instruments and tools are increasingly something just to be owned and not necessarily something to be used to make music. Um, Right. Well, like, you know, like it seems like a huge kind of motivating factor for people to buy new instruments is to post clips on Instagram and demo videos. Like more, more about the instrument. People, people, yeah. people, yeah, people make more money off of doing synth demos than they do actually selling music. Yeah. Um, which is a really kind of perverse, like, uh, just it's a really perverse economy. Yeah, and it seems, and in like I, I feel like, uh, you know old coveted instruments increasingly end up in you know the uh home of an italian dentist (laughs) you know uh people who collect these things and i don't want to you know slag off people that that elka synthex yeah this is not an anti-italian uh no no not at all not at all (laughs) but anti-dentistry yes his partner collects (laughs) guitars yeah it's the same thing in the world of guitars i mean there's yeah yeah endless endless chatter and discussion of does it have the perloid in-law inlay and this one was made in 1953 and are are these people playing these things or or not you know yeah hobbyists and commodity fetishists yeah Yeah. but you know what i want to ask where are the women in all this and the panel like well we had what we had we heard some ladies singing maybe twice no but we haven't heard any comp- comp- compositions by women. None, none of none of the women I wrote responded. Oh, they don't like us. Yeah, yeah. Back uh, in well, you I, tried. I, I, Kate, Katie would normally be here, I, but Katie's busy. I know. Yeah. yeah, I tried to have a conversation uh, a few years ago with Danny Wolfer's Lego Welt, and just kind of be like, man, like what you know, thinking about the way Dutch people tend to be, and this is an anti-Dutch <laughs> podcast, by the way. Um, <laughs> Not Italian. <laughs> they invented capitalism, so yeah. I mean, yep, it really is. More ways See, than one. full circle. Um, but no, and then I asked Danny, I was like, yo, like, you know, you guys are so prolific. You've done all these records. What's up with that? You know, you and your crew in The Hague. It's like, we just didn't know any girls. And that, that was his response. <laughs> That's to, why they make that was, Yeah, well, and that was his whole entire response to that. Um, I, I think that with, with Dawson, uh, with Nick Dawson's thing, what I really like about that recording is the full utilization of the instrument. And this is what he does in everything he does. Um, he pushes the gear to a place. Uh, he gets the full use out of it. So even coming up with a recording of the firmware update sure, yeah, yeah. is like... Um, I think sure it's it, you know it's it's a it's, little it's, it's a little a, coy but it's also like oh you're absolutely extrapolating all <laughs> of the resource of this thing that you can and it's in not, a not to tail and also it's a really cool way <laughs> yeah. because aesthetically there's all of this music that operates today and for a, there's a long history of it obviously of computer music that's like rooted in uh, these kinds of sonic tropes and for him to sort of be able to pull that in just like a, a menial task I like I like I like that a lot yeah yeah it's, it's, and it's uh, like uh, as Stephen alluded to earlier with the Ramones and you know punk um you know the firmware update it, I think in the manual explicitly says you know do not listen to this oh yeah yeah no actually Nick, Nick <laughs> and of did, course what could be more punk right than, than just <laughs> listening Nick to Nick it. did include I, I have here he, he said uh where is it he said also a little note about my blurb Requirements, an audio player or personal computer capable of audio playback, a stereo mini jack audio cable, AC adapter K350 or 6AA batteries. Do not playback the system update file on any speaker or headphone system, as this could lead to damage the equipment and or hearing loss. (laughs) 
Nick is the man. That's cool. <laughs> computer a computer can't do that. Computer can't tell can't listen to something you're not supposed to listen to. Right. Anybody else want to get a microphone here? Anybody else? <laughs> I, th I think they're good. <laughs> Well, we it's, uh, for those who can't see uh, on the video and in the audio recording, we're in front of like 75 people <laughs> in a room fit for 50. So, yeah, we'll open it up for Q&A after. That'll be the, the Patreon exclusives, right? Oh, yeah, this is going to be a four hour episode. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, we have we have a, a poem here from uh, from Chris Zaldua. Our, uh, our, you know, uh, base camp uh, comrade um, who could not make it for the event. Um, should I just read read Chris's poem? Yeah, please. Uh, this I don't think he attached a title, but he said he's been uh, working on a piece, uh, kind of a retrospective of his life with music. It's very bittersweet. So this topic touched on a lot of, uh, a lot of feels for him. Uh, so here, here is the poem. Lights on, night's over. Pack up, once more. Hope for dollars, get dimes. New city, next gig. Try again, try harder. Small crowd, new faces. Give it all. Why bother? A flicker, a spark. Ears open, mood changes, memories made, visions transmitted. No answers, no solutions. All you've got, may as well. The moments matter, but it never gets easier, over and over, all over again. It's all we've got. And there it is, lights on, night's over. The elective burden, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Was, what did you expect? You know, what what do you expect? What are your <clears throat> entitlements? What do you? And that goes back to the ritual. Is if you're not finding a deep affinity with the task at hand, then you're necessarily maybe askew. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean. Nice, nice, Chris Aldua. Yes, yeah, sweet, sweet poem. Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> Was that the conclusive media? Uh, there's, oh, there's, there's one more, one more short piece. Cool. Um, we have from my dear friend and uh, uh, letter S bandmate Sam De La Rosa. This is just titled "The End of Music." Thank <laughs> you. 
guitar player yeah I like that guy so yeah that was that was the end of music that was a lot of good music yeah yeah that was amazing doesn't sound like much of an end to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's funny to I when I you know you've known Sam for a very long time but like in relation to Chris's poem uh, that is the, the exact circumstances I met Sam in Los Angeles when we played together. You know, cert, you know, fair amount of people could be more. Lights go down. You know, and yeah, that kind of ritual kinship that occurs when you experience that regularly, and the kind of uh, unspoken uh, bonds that sort of build in this very interesting community and again when i think of the the prompt i think the only answer to that is to do like a really deep foregoing of any other concern beyond that which was eloquently put in the in your your poem as well your so yeah yeah community's good friends are good <laughs> right on <laughs> <laughs> peace peace love <laughs> yeah no no i uh uh i i agree i i mean yeah i, I do broadly think yeah pe people are going to keep making music and i, I guess you, you you were touching on there nick uh the like the kinship of artists and the community of artists is one that uh is different in some ways than than the community of of listeners yeah and that let's that yeah I mean the context we're doing this in today is in an exhibition that is in a very specific similarly kind of parasitic context uh, this is a show in a gallery we're having this conversation in a space uh, that is yeah, primarily well, geared towards full on hol hollow mirrors right now yeah full primarily geared towards very specific contemporary art um, community and the conversations within them. And the idea that I found that I can negotiate all of these kinds of problematic things that sort of bounce into each other is to just subvert the role of the space to have as many people come in and perform and do things like this and talk through ideas as possible. Um, and it's centered on our orality. It's centered on, it's centered on sound music's inherent kind of democratic and revelatory potential um, in a way that I, I posit is beyond any other sort of art framework um, that exists. And trying to sort of uh, couple rather than decouple something like that in a space like this is important to me. Um, access is important to me. Dialogue is very important to me. and. Um, you know, y'all's podcast for all of this Who knows? time, you know, Who you knows? said you're on episode 38, roughly. It's a lot, Maybe right? I'm 38 there, but, uh, It's a ballpark. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that's like a... Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good segue into sort of uh, uh, adding to the framework or the rhizome of that thinking. And um, I appreciate y'all participating in this, truly. Thank you. Yeah. That was really cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I... Uh, well, of course, yeah, uh, agree with that mission statement and uh, happy happy to contribute. And uh, uh, yeah, does we 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 do have well maybe not quite seventy five <laughs> people here, but uh, there are a few members. In There's the like audience. seven to five. <laughs> There's like seven to five people here. I, that's what I said earlier, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, does Thoughts. does anyone uh, in our audience have any uh, any questions or any uh, any insights? No, no stupid questions. Cool. All, All right. right. Yeah, sure. thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye. Hasta luego. <laughs>